Okay, so let's have a look at the next part of the Basics of Cryptography series of lectures. So in this presentation we're going to have a look at a uh, bit more detail in public key encryption and especially looking at digital certificates uh, using the private key to be able to identify an entity and then at the very end we'll look at uh, PGP or pretty good privacy. Okay, so let's bring back Bob and here is Alice and then in the middle we have Eve and what we'll do is we'll we'll try and make sure that Bob and Alice can communicate with each other and for Bob to identify, identify himself to Eve and also for Alice to know that the messages haven't been changed. Okay, so there's our keys, there's Bob's public and private key, there's Alice's public and private key on the other side. And in this presentation, we'll have a look at how we can use these little things called the digital certificates. So there's Bob's and there's Alice's. And how we can use these to make sure that we have C, I, A. The C stands for confidentiality. The I stands for integrity. And the A stands for availability. Okay, we're not going to focus too much on availability, but we'll have a look at the other two. So the C is to make sure that the message is secret, I, that the identity is proven, and I, that the message is unchanged. Okay, so let's, let's have a look at a bit more detail now. And we'll look at some basics of public key encryption. You'll find all the details on our security site, uh, all the examples of public key encryption, and so on there. Okay, so let's, let's put Bob and Alice back again. Okay, so here we go. Uh, this is Bob's public key. We'll make it green. And let's get the yellow pen out. And this is his private key. Okay, so here's the message that he wants to send to Alice. So what he wants to make sure is that uh, the message is secure and also that he can identify himself properly to Alice and that the message has been unchanged. So the first thing that we do is that we take a hash signature of the message. So let's say we take an MD5 hash. And then the next thing we do is that we take Bob's private key and then we're going to take the hash value and we're going to encrypt it with Bob's private key. Okay, so remember that. Bob's private key has encrypted that little bit there. So the next thing we have is that uh, we have uh, how do we identify Bob to Alice and vice versa if we need to? Well, what we have is a trusted third party. We'll call them Trent here. And Trent works for Megacorp, and both Bob and Alice trust Megacorp to be able to prove both Bob's identity and Alice's and so on. They've done some checking, and Alice can be sure that that checking is enough to make sure that Bob really is Bob. Okay, so let's give Alice her keys. So what we have is that uh, Trent, as we'll see, issues Alice with a digital certificate. You'll see that that digital certificate has two keys on it, a public key and a private key, and it's signed by the Megacorp company. And then what we do is that we then export that into something that can just be distributed because we don't really want to give away Alice's private key. We export that so that uh, we have a digital certificate with Alice's public key on it. And that can be transmitted to anyone. So then Bob will take Alice's public key. He will then encrypt with Alice's public key the message and this encrypted hash, then he can send it over the other side and we'll see what happens when Alice receives it. Okay, so remember we've we've encrypted the hash signature with with uh, Bob's private key. We then took that and the message and we encrypted it with Alice's public key. Okay, so let's let's bring this back again and we'll see what happens on the other side. Okay, so we'll bring in Bob's certificate here because we're going to be using that in a little minute. And you can see Bob's certificate has a public and a private key on it. 
it's a good way that you can keep these keys together in, in a single place. Okay, so the here is our message that's been sent over to Alice. Okay, so there's the message inside this encrypted box, which was encrypted by Alice's public key. Okay, that's red. So the first question that we have is which key will Alice use to be able to open up that encrypted box? Okay, let's just write it here. Okay, give you a minute to think about that. We've used Alice's public key, or Bob has used Alice's public key. Which key should Alice use now? Well, the great thing with public key encryption is that the two keys work together. Alice will use her private key to be able to open up that box. She opens it up, has a look at the message. Mm, that's fine, yeah. I'm a bit worried that it might not be Bob, so let's have a look at this other box here. Now what we do is that uh, Bob now sends over his digital certificate, signed by Trent. And he trusts, and she trusts, Megacorp. So which key should Alice now use to prove, to open up that yellow box? Which key should she use to open it up? I'll give you a minute to think about that one. Okay, it was encrypted by Bob's private key. So the key that will open that up is Bob's public key which Alice has found on his digital certificate. She then unencrypts the hash signature. She then takes an MD5 hash of herself of the message. And now, what do you think she does? She'll take the two hash signatures together, and if they're the same, then... Guess what? We've proven Bob's identity. Because only Bob would have had that private key, so it would have been possible for anyone else to get that. And we've also verified the contents of the message that they've not been changed. So that's really how uh, public key encryption works. So I'll have a look at an example with inside secure web traffic, which is a good example of when we use uh, encryption and identity. Okay, so there's Bob and we have Alice. In this case, Alice is going to be a, a web server. And we have Trent in between both Bob and Alice trust Trent to be able to prove identity. So Bob goes and logs on. Uh, the site itself has uh, a key, has two keys, public key and private key. And then when he logs on, in this case to PayPal, what we see is a little green uh, box there and the HTTPS. HTTPS means that we're creating a tunnel between us and the the destination. It happens when we use Google, when we do a search, it's automatically an HTTPS connection. So that makes sure that, that we're secure. And the next part is that uh, the identif identification of the site has happened through this digital certificate. If we trust the certificate, then everything's fine. The way it normally works isn't with public key encryption to keep things secure. What we normally have is we use Diffie-Hellman to be able to exchange for our private key. That's the way that the tunnel will work, the encryption will work, uh, and not public key in, in this case. And what we do is that we create a session key, typically with AES, for our encrypted content. Okay, so both public key and private key work together. The private key is very good for encryption, keeping things secure and public key is actually very good at proving identity. So you can see there that the two methods can work very well together. And we'll look a bit more detail at that. So there's the session key. Great thing about session key is even though someone might crack it within one session, it's going to change for the next session. So we're fairly secure. HTTPS, SSL are, is normally secure apart from the man in the middle type attack. So let's have a look at a bit in a bit more detail at these little digital certificates that we actually have. Okay, so there's what we buy. We buy something and you look at the little key there. That little key means that this digital certificate has the private key on it. This isn't a certificate that we would distribute to anyone because it has our secret private key. 
minute we give the private key away, someone can prove, someone can be us, they can, they can show uh, their identity as being us. So we need to make sure that that is kept secret. So what we distribute is a, is, is a public certificate. We see in this case, the certificate doesn't actually have the little key symbol there. So this only has the public key actually on it. OK, so there we go. That's what we saw. So when we look at our certificate, and we're meant to really look at that to make sure that we trust it, we see the entity. The entity in this case is who it was issued to, when it's valid, and who it was issued by. And then we can look at the details. So here we go. There's the public key of this, of the within the certificate, 2048 bits, RSA, which is public key. We has a thumbprint. The thumbprint makes sure that the certificate hasn't actually been changed or modified in any sort of way. So there's our thumbprint. And then finally, we have one of the most important things for proving the that that it's that we both we trust it is the issuer the issuer of the certificate if both both and Bob and Alice trust the issuer then they will trust the certificate okay so let's have a look at what's called PKI public key infrastructure okay so we'll draw uh, Alice at the side now and we're going to have a look at how Alice identifies herself to Bob. So as we've seen on the internet, we typically have a trusted third party, in this case Trent. And Trent is Trusted Root Certificate Authority. And he runs a company. There we go. And that's uh, Megacorp again. And both Bob and Alice trust Megacorp. They know about them and the procedures that they'll do to be able to, to verify uh, Bob and Alice. If there's a problem with them, they might kick them off the trust network, but just now they, they both trust them. Okay, so this trusted route can actually certify uh, certificates, can actually publish certificates for a whole range of, uh, of reasons. The companies we get, VeriSign, GoDaddy, Entrust, Microsoft Trust and so on, these certi these uh, certificates that they have. So here we go. Here's the uh, trusted root certificate. They tend to be embedded into the operating systems and really can't be changed. These are the ones that will actually be used to be able to verify the credibility of any certificates issued by that trusted root. So we don't really want these to be tampered with at all. In this case, that's a very same one. So we install on our machine, either uh, it's an installed as a default within our operating system, it can't be changed because we don't really want to change these ones, or the user will actually trust uh, certificates to be installed onto their machine with their rights. Okay, so it's important that we understand the certificates that, that we actually have on our machine. So there we go, it's installed on both sides there. OK, so Alice goes to Trent and says, I want a certificate. Trent asks for ID and some uh, some extra checking and so on to make sure that, uh, that she really is Alice. So then uh, what will happen next is that Trent will issue a certificate and he will sign that certificate. OK, we can see it's signed at the bottom there verified by Megacorp and it's that signature that makes sure that uh, that certificate is, is valid. What Alice does then is she will then pick off the certificate uh, with her public key. The, that certificate then can be sent over to, to Bob. Bob then checks the certificate against the, the trusted third party to make sure that it was really signed by Trent and he checks that and everything's fine. So now let's look at uh, various certificate types because there's three main types that, that we get. So the types of things that we might want to certify 
are security email, server authentication, code signing, driver authentication, time stamping, client authentication, IP tunneling, and encrypted file systems. So a top level CA can really sign all of these, it's trusted to sign it, where uh, intermediate ones might be focused on purely signing one or two little bits. So maybe an operating system would be trusted to signing would be trusted to sign things like uh, code signing, but not for secure email. So at the very top level, we have these trusted root authorities or trusted CAs. And then below that, we have uh, intermediate uh, certificate authorities, certification authorities. These really focus on signing certain things. We can see the example here, the Microsoft Windows hardware uh, is is issued by the Microsoft Root Authority. The Microsoft Root Authority is a trusted root authority. And then we have this Microsoft Windows hardware. So this one is only responsible for signing code window and Windows hardware driver uh, verification. That's its only purpose. If it tries to do anything else, then it won't be allowed. And then the last type, and one that really isn't... Uh, worth much is self-signed. So self-signed just means that the person, the entity has signed that they have their own identity that they're proven to themselves. So these really have very little trust at all. In fact, zero trust or zero credibility. Okay, so let's now have a look at a typical security setup. And we'll see how public and private key can actually uh, work together. Okay, Bob and Alice. Bob po uh, Alice pops over her digital certificate and proves herself to Bob. Then, often what we do is that we set up through Diffie Hellman a key exchange. Okay, the two the two parties can actually define what the key uh, its size is going to be, what the different method is and then they use a certain type of Diffie-Hellman to be able to negotiate a session key. And it's this session key which is actually used through private key encryption, typically AES, to be able to set up a secure tunnel between Bob and Alice. Good thing with session, as I said earlier, is that every single session has a different key and we can also time out the key. Maybe after one day we can renegotiate a new key Okay, so private key is really the workhorse of this type of uh, thing. Public key really has so much of an overhead uh, and it's fairly processor intensive that it's quite difficult for it to be used in this type of application on a range of devices. Then, as we've seen, what we do is that if we want to prove uh, Alice's identity and continue to prove it, then we take a message and we use Alice's private key. We then sign it and then goes over and then Bob uses Alice's public key which he has gained from her digital certificate. In this way uh, he proves her identity and also authenticates any messages. So as a last thing let's have a look at PGP, Pretty Good Privacy. It's a kind of different method uh, but it fits in very well. It uses an ingenious way of actually keeping things secret. And we have Phil Zinnemann to thank for PGP. So he was quite worried that uh, email traffic could be easily uh, uh, easily looked into, uh, could be sniffed uh, and the contents examined and also that anyone could actually send uh, an email message pretended to be anyone else. This is still the case. Unfortunately, we haven't really uh, developed a secure email infrastructure on the internet. But PGP certainly answers those problems. So first, here's Bob. And PGP was really developed at a time that uh, public key encryption would have actually been very difficult to set up. So here's uh, Bob's message. And there we go, just like we did before. We take the hash signature of the message and then we encrypt it with Bob's private key. Okay, so we are using public key here but we're using the pipe key. And this is the thing that differs. Let's actually create a session key 
randomly so we'll create a session key and what we'll do rather than using public key encryption we'll use the session key to be able to encrypt the message and this md5 hash okay so this is a completely new key that we've created it's up to us so if it's cracked once then it's okay because the next time it won't be cracked so we'll put our message in and let's put our uh, md5 hash right then so this is the magic here what happens next so remember we've encrypted with with uh, this new session key what happens next is we take the session key and then we encrypt with Alice's public key okay so it's a very small amount of data uh, just just the key that's wrapped up with inside this public key we would then zip the whole thing up and send it off as a zip and now we can send it over the other side he's arriving and there's the encrypted content so obviously the encrypted content we can't read because we don't know what the session key is so what Alice does is Alice will use her private key to be able to open up the encrypted key it's really quite a smart method so now what she is able to do so it didn't take really much processing power to be able to just decrypt that little key she'll take the session key and then she's able to decrypt the contents of the message and then she'll go through the same thing as we went through before she pop off the message, she pop off the, the yellow box with the MD5 hash she'll then take Bob's public key from his digital certificate she'll then unencrypt the yellow box to read the hash she'll then take the hash off the message and compare it with the hash from Bob's encrypted private uh, key and if they, if they are the same then she has proven Bob's identity and also that the message hasn't been changed okay so this has been a quick introduction to uh, digital certificates public key and also uh, PKI and PGP